Hey, what's up guys? We're going to be talking about baseball anatomy today. If you're a trainer, a coach, a player, and you want to learn about the anatomy relative to the baseball player, I'm going to go over the scapula, the humerus, the muscles associated with the rotator cuff, the glenohumeral joint, and then talk about how this all relates to throwing and actually training for baseball. Let's go ahead and dive into it. All right, so let's talk about the scapula, more commonly known as the shoulder blade. This is the big triangle-shaped bone that sits on the posterior, or the back of the rib cage here. And the position of the scapula controls the position of the humerus, which controls the position of the arm and ultimately the hand to deliver the ball. So the scapula has a number of motions here. One of the big ones for baseball is upward rotation. That motion is controlled by three main muscle groups. The first being the serratus anterior, which actually wraps all the way around the underside of the scapula here and out onto the ribs. That helps get that scapula up and around. In addition to that, we have the upper trap coming down from the cervical spine region down to the scapula, as well as the lower trap. And the lower trap has this orientation down through the inferior medial side of that scapula to help that force coupling of those three muscles in providing that upward rotation motion. So a lot of times you'll see this with a serratus wall slide exercise, and you can see the inferior border of the scapula sliding around the rib cage. So you'll, you'll look for that inferior medial border pushing out and around as the arm moves up. The scapula and the humerus bone work together to provide that upward reaching motion. As the scapula rotates about one degree, the glenohumeral joint moves two degrees, meaning that in combination, they combine for about 60 degrees of upward rotation from the scapula and 120 degrees of elevation from the humerus to actually create a full overhead reaching position. One of the important joints at that scapula is the glenohumeral joint between the glenoid rim, which is this portion at the lateral side of the scapula, and that is connected to the humerus bone. So the humerus bone is that whole upper arm bone, and specifically the head of the humerus sits in the glenoid. It's really shallow in the socket, almost like a golf ball and a golf tee. The humerus, as it lifts up, is gonna kinda lift up and then slide back into that medial position in the joint, roll up and then slide in order to provide that arm elevation. Oh, we should put this part in, because I found this pretty humorous. We should put this scene in, because I found this humorous. Hey, we should put this scene in the video because I found this humorous. Okay, so let's talk about the glenohumeral joint. So we actually have something that deepens that joint called the labrum. So the labrum goes all the way around the glenoid rim here, and it kind of helps to pull that humerus into the glenoid and deepen that ball and socket joint. So the bicep muscle actually from the elbow goes all the way up and the long head of the bicep runs through this bicipital groove here and attaches to the superior portion of the labrum. So a lot of times if you hear of a slap tear, which is really common in baseball players, that's this superior labrum kind of detaching from the glenoid rim here. So we're going to want good ball and socket congruency if we want to say safe at the shoulder. <laughs> All right, so with that glenohumeral joint, this is where the rotator cuff works. So the rotator cuff sits on the back and the front of the scapula, and it's deep to the deltoid muscle. One portion of the rotator cuff is the supraspinatus, which actually is above this portion right here, the spine of the scapula, wrapping up from the top of the scapula all the way down to the top of the humerus here. That is what controls the first 30 degrees of abduction and pulls the humerus into the glenoid. In addition to the supraspinatus, right under the spine of the scapula, we have the infraspinatus muscle. And that wraps under that spine of the scapula all the way over to the humerus again. And this is gonna wrap onto the back side of that humerus bone to kind of help externally rotate the humerus. One more helper kind of to the infraspinatus is that teres minor muscle, which we can kind of see right here on that lateral inferior border of the scapula. And that, again, is going to be an external rotator. So when we see an exercise like a sideline external rotation as kind of the traditional rotator cuff exercise, that's primarily loading the infraspinatus and the teres minor, which are really important players in stabilizing that humerus into the glenoid. All right, so on the front side of the scapula, which would be located in the armpit area, we are gonna see the subscapularis. So this muscle is again the fourth rotator cuff muscle, and it still inserts onto the humerus here and helps with that function of pulling the humerus into the glenoid cavity, but this is the only of the rotator cuff muscles that controls internal rotation, meaning pulling that humerus kind of internally like that. All right, so if we look 
Again, on that front side of the scapula bone, we have this coracoid process. We have a number of muscles that attach here, and that would be the pec minor, which attaches from here onto the ribs here, three through five. We have the coracobrachialis reaching down to the humerus, as well as the short head of the biceps going all the way down to the elbow. All these muscles attaching the coracoid process, in addition to that serratus anterior, which again was wrapping around the rib cage here, these are all going to protract the scapula. And we think about protracting, we're thinking about pushing the scapula around the rib cage. All right, so one joint to cover that's relevant for baseball players here is the acromioclavicular joint, and that's basically attaching the clavicle here to the acromion process of the scapula. So a lot of times with like a dislocation injury or something, we'll see the acromion offset and kind of a bump presentation here between the end of the clavicle and the start of the acromion. So a lot of exercises that are typically programmed for baseball players are focused on retraction and depression of the scapula. And a lot of times what we're trying to do is target that low trap and that line of pull through the inferior medial border of the scapula here. If we're gonna do that, again, we're kind of bringing that inferior border towards the spine. And then on the opposite side, we also wanna work those exercises that are involving protraction and upward rotation to give ourselves good congruency between the scapula and the humerus. All right, so a common presentation for baseball players is a loss of internal rotation. Now that can come from a couple of different things. One possibility is internal rotation deficit, a lot of times called GERD or glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. If the athlete has some soft tissue restriction in the posterior capsule and they can't quite internally rotate as far, that's one option for where, where they're losing that motion. Another potential reason why an athlete has less internal rotation is just an adaptation at the actual head of the humerus here in the actual bony anatomy. So if the head of the humerus points straight into the socket, but over time, especially for young pitchers, gets a ton of torsional stress from the pitching motion, a lot of times that head of the humerus can relatively begin to point further back and become what we call retroverted. So a retroverted player a lot of times loses internal rotation as the head of the humerus starts to point farther back and you lose that position on the anterior side of the capsule and you have extra external rotation. So from all that time in the layback phase and that load, the bone, especially if the growth plates are open while pitching, adapts to that position and gives you more range of motion in external rotation and kind of takes away that internal rotation. Again, we want to disassociate the pathology from the presentation. So just because you have loss of internal rotation and maybe some of these bony morphological changes doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have pain. A lot of times that humeral retroversion is, is kind of a natural adaptation that whenever you get stronger and grow, you can work around that. Um, that said, you know, if you are losing internal rotation and need to stretch into it, there are some things you could do with internal rotation stretching for that. An important ligament for baseball players is this anterior glenohumeral ligament that basically connects the front of the glenoid here over to the humerus on the anterior side. And this is what protects the ball and socket congruency of the joint so that it doesn't slide too far forward on the socket during motions. You know what, let's take a short stop on the elbow before we dive into the thoracic spine. All right, so the pitching motion, and especially the layback phase of it, puts a stress on the medial side of the elbow, specifically on this triangle ligament down here called the ulnar collateral ligament. So the ulnar collateral ligament attaches the ulna bone to the distal portion of the humerus bone here. So specifically that anterior and posterior band connecting that humerus to the ulna get a lot of stress during that layback phase of the pitch over time. And this is part of the reason that we want to control pitch counts and whatnot to prevent down the road tearing of this UCL and something like a Tommy John procedure. Is this video getting too formal? I feel like I need to be more laid back. All right, so coming to the back here, we have the thoracic spine, and good care of the thoracic spine can make a huge difference in the mechanics of a throw. If we can work into some more thoracic extension, thoracic rotation, that will allow a better arm delivery because we take some stress off of the anterior humerus. So if we can't rotate at the spine, a lot of times we'll over rotate at the humerus and then put stress on that anterior glenohumeral joint in that anterior socket whereas if we can actually get some good rotation out of that thoracic spine we can deliver the humerus and then the hand a little bit better 
All right, so let's talk about the lats. The lats go all the way down here from the thoracolumbar fascia, wrap around, and actually insert on the front of the humerus. So the lat muscle actually does a few motions. It does extension, internal rotation, and adduction. All right, guys, so I hope you learned something about baseball anatomy today. The Movement System channel is all about teaching people about movement. If you like learning about movement, you're a trainer, a coach, an athlete, go ahead and hit the subscribe button, and I'll catch you in the next one. Thanks.